My name is Gail Rousseau. I'm a clinical professor of neurosurgery at George Washington University in Washington, D.C., and it's an absolute pleasure to be with you all at the Seattle Science Foundation. It's a particular pleasure and an honor to talk about this topic, which is very near and dear to my heart, diversity in neurosurgery. Uh, I was asked about a year ago to produce a short essay on this topic for an upcoming uh, book that's coming out on diversity in neurosurgery, or on, on surviving neurosurgery. And um, I decided I really wanted to dig into it. And so to that end, I um, had the great good fortune of being able to recruit a team to work on this topic with me that is in itself diverse. So my co-authors that you see listed there represent a diverse group in terms of race and religion and gender, uh, language, uh, gender orientation. So it's, it's a great privilege to have worked on this. It's an ongoing process uh, as all uh, study of diversity is, and I'm really very pleased to be able to share our work with you today. Um, this work was uh, published in World Neurosurgery last year, uh, but we continue to work on it, and um, I think you'll be hearing more from this team, and I hope that we will um, instill an interest in uh, improving our record in diversity in neurosurgery among everybody who hears this presentation. Well, there are some things I think we can agree about from the very beginning. We all agree, I believe, that we need the best possible people to go into the field of neurosurgery. And I think we all know intuitively that a key driver of excellence and innovation is diversification. And the whole point of this study is to present to you the elements that we've learned from not only neurosurgery, but from other disciplines that really prove that diversity is a driver of both innovation and excellence. So here's a brief outline of the things that I'd like to go over with you. We'll talk about academic neurosurgery and diversity. Then we'll talk about some of the diversity issues and progress we've made or maybe haven't made in neurosurgery, some lessons we've learned from other professions, and then going a bit further afield, looking at the fields of economics and ecology, what we can learn from those disciplines and diversity. Well, first, let's talk about academics. If you're in the academic aspect of any medical field, you know this that the NIH takes diversity seriously. Uh, they do that not because they just simply think it's the right thing to do, but because they're all about good science. And there's a science to diversity. And they know that innovation and success are driven by having diverse groups of people and diverse points of view and attacking our common problems. So the NIH is actively involved in uh, research and in programs and initiatives that help to mitigate obstacles to research within, within uh, uh, medical fields, to looking at implicit bias and a whole host of issues in our world today that interfere with our ability to get the best possible outcomes from groups of people working together. So if you want to be successful in academic medicine, you need the NIH, and the NIH requires diversity. Well, what about our experience in our own field of neurosurgery? Well, uh, I would say that it's quite clear from this photo and from what we know about history that neurosurgery was somewhat diverse from the beginning. This early black and white photo shows that it wasn't just white men who started neurosurgery, that in fact, from the beginning, there was a woman. But it wasn't widely diverse, but there was one woman, Dr. Louise Eisenhart, and she wasn't just anyone. 
She was not a neurosurgeon, but she was a renowned expert on uh, tumors, brain tumors, and neuropathology. In fact, she was Harvey Cushing's right-hand man. She went on to become the first woman president of the Harvey Cushing Society, now known as the AANS, and she was the first editor-in-chief of the Journal of Neurosurgery. Gender diversity within neurosurgery took a little bit longer, and it actually started outside of the United States with Europe, where Dr. Diana Beck and Dr. Sofia Ionescu in the UK and Romania uh, were the first general surgeons to uh, tailor their practice to neurological conditions. But it was actually Turkey where the first board-certified woman neurosurgeon received her diploma, and that was Dr. Uh, Professor Altanak in 1959. And I'm very pleased to be able to say that it was at my own institution of George Washington University in Washington, D.C., where America trained its first board-certified woman in neurosurgeon. That was Dr. Ruth Kerjacobi, who was certified in 1961. And then that trend followed around the world, where in 1968, T.S. Kanaka became board-certified in India. But notice how long it took for gender to be able to be represented, uh, excuse me, for, for race to be able to be represented as well. Dr. Alexa Kennedy was the first African-American woman to be board certified in the United States. That was in 1984, a full 23 years, more than a generation after the first white woman. And then within our own lifetimes, and in fact within our recent memory, my good friend, Dr. Naja Labadi, became the first woman professor of neurosurgery in the continent of Africa. Well, this relative rarity of women in the profession of neurosurgery led to a fairly startling coffee break in 1989 at a national neurosurgical meeting when this small group of women noticed that there were other women at a neurosurgical annual meeting for the first time. And so we decided to get together that evening. And from that chance encounter, Women in Neurosurgery was created, now almost 30 years ago. And the mission behind the organization was just to support other women in the profession. The profession continued to recruit women and um, continued to slowly but surely recognize the contributions of women, so much so that by nearly 20 years later, it's true, but the board of directors of the AANS recognized this growing minority of women neurosurgeons and asked for a white paper on the status of women in neurosurgery at that time. And so this paper the, on the recruitment and retention of women in neurosurgery was published in JNS in 2008. And I'm just so pleased that then AANS president Jim Bean asked to write an editorial about this, and he noted in recognition of the findings of this report that the AANS leadership acknowledge the need for active measures to ensure that every neurosurgeon enjoyed the same benefits and opportunities by dismantling the barriers and offering a hand again uh, across the remaining gulfs that separate the privileged from the deserving. And we're still working on that today, but I think this goal of uh, extending a hand across the gulfs that separate the privileged from the deserving is the first step toward recognizing the value of diversity. And we thank Dr. Bean for that. So we know that offering opportunities for everyone of diverse background is the right thing to do. But it goes beyond that. The diversity gap shows that even now, 40 years later, only 6% of ABNS certified practicing neurosurgeons are women. Less than 4% are black or African. And that means that if you have the, the joint uh, minority status of being an African-American woman, you're represented by less than 1% 
of neurosurgeons in the United States. And there are systemic barriers as well. There's an academic progression gap that many departments are familiar with, where women start in the pipeline but as assistant professors, but never quite get promoted to the leadership positions. Or the pay gap, and you may not care about it unless you're married to a neurosurgeon, and then you care a lot about whether uh, your spouse is making the same thing as their male peers. So gender diversity in neurosurgery is something that has uh, been recognized for over 30 years, and other organizations have taken the same idea of wins, women in neurosurgery, and the value that those kinds of groups represent and embedded it in their own culture. So the World Federation of Neurosurgical Societies has a women in neurosurgery group. You see some of them there. The uh, European Association of Neurosurgical Societies just two years ago started its diversity task force, which is actively working to build those bridges that separate the remaining gulfs between the privileged and the deserving. And they, too, recognize that it calls for active measures, that, that change just doesn't happen fast enough if we wait for it to happen on its own. So fast forward to uh, 2019, we're looking back on the first 100 years of neurosurgery as a specialty and uh, working on a series of reports on a look back at the first century of neurosurgery and a look forward at the future. And one of those papers was 100 Years of Neurosurgery, the Contributions of American Women, in which we looked at what had happened in the course of history of that first century of American neurosurgery. And what we were so pleased to find is that that spark really caught fire around the world, so that once that was published and the COVID pandemic started, all these writing groups developed, research and writing groups on every continent, so that you had uh, women who were interested in writing their own history. And uh, I like to think that Dr. Spetzler uh, and his somewhat of a call to action way back in his 2011 paper may have had something to do with that. In that article, one of his uh, well, relatively rare single author papers, Dr. Spetzler wrote, the scant historical literature devoted to women in the field of neurosurgery suggests not that their contributions are less worthy than those of their male counterparts, as much as that their contributions have yet to be fully recounted. So I'm happy to say that in 2021, those contributions have been fully recounted. So uh, women neurosurgeons uh, gathered together on every continent, Australasia, Middle East, Latin America, Europe and Africa, and a series of uh, nearly a dozen articles were published this year on those topics so that the history of women in neurosurgery around the world has now been recounted. And it will be developed as time goes on. Well, let's switch gears a little bit to racial diversity in neurosurgery. It was Dr. Clarence Green, the who was the first African-American neurosurgeon. He was board certified in 1953. Deborah Hyde was the second, uh, and she was the second African-American woman neurosurgeon in 1985. Some of my colleagues uh, may be familiar with this outstanding neurosurgeon and poet, Dr. Latunde Odeko. He was the first African-American neurosurgeon to be trained in the United States. He was born in Nigeria, and he has been a, uh, a poet, an inspirational mentor to many, many neurosurgeons. And in fact, we're, uh, that is my copy of his book of poetry, Out of the Night, that you see there. And uh, we're working on an updated biography on him right now. Well, our... Uh, African-American colleagues in neurosurgery were inspired as a result of the George Floyd murder and Black Lives Matter to speak out on this topic, which heretofore had been a taboo within neurosurgery, to talk about our separation or our divisions, our differences. And so our 
uh, black colleagues put out this statement that they are in the unique position to speak up against cyclical and imminent public health threats to the black community. And they vowed to do so fiercely and persistently and noted that the excessive use of police force and violence was a public health issue. So we're starting to see neurosurgeons in minority groups who are taking that privileged position of being a neurosurgeon and using it to using their voice for public good. There are other racial issues in neurosurgery. Dr. Linda Liao uh, is a outstanding example of this. She is Asian American. She's a chairman of neurosurgery at uh, in the department at UCLA, and she's been inducted to the National Academy of Medicine. Well, while we're talking about diversity, we've talked about gender and race, but there are a number of types of diversity, and all of them should be discussed. And I think we need to talk more about gender minorities. We need to talk more about immigrants. Neurosurgery has certainly benefited from the presence of geographic transplants in our midst. I mean, where would we be if Ghazi Yazergil hadn't left Iran and gone to Zurich and then the United States? Or Dr. Q had never been able to cross that border from Mexico and come to the U.S. and do all the great work he's doing in brain tumors? Or Volker Sontag uh, and the transformation in spinal surgery that he ushered in in his very productive years at the Barrow Neurological Institute. And while we're talking about various forms of diversity, uh, what about neurosurgeons living with a disability? I'm showing the example of my good friend, Corinne Morasco. Here she is operating uh, from a chair. Dr. Morasco would be the first to speak out on the, her position as both as a double minority. She's a woman neurosurgeon and a disabled neurosurgeon. and. Uh, she feels very strongly, I think all who know her agree, that she is an extremely competent, capable, and impactful neurosurgeon, despite those impediments uh, and ex uh, despite those elements of diversity that she represents in our field. Or how about this, Dr. Michael Biggs, our colleague in Australia, who actually was told by a senior member of his department who took him aside and said he should go find another specialty, something else to do, because he could never make a decent neurosurgeon because he stuttered. Well, I don't know about you, but I don't think it requires speaking without a stutter to be able to perform elegant surgery. We now have a president of the United States who has a stutter. We know that a stutter doesn't interfere in any way with one's ability to perform one's capable job. And then as I get older, I'm particularly interested in this group, and maybe some of you are as well, and that is ageism in neurosurgery. Uh, we know that because it takes so darn long for us to train that neurosurgeons tend to skew a little bit older among doctors, and yet we spend so much time training. There's such a huge personal and societal investment in our neurosurgical careers, and then after a relatively short period of time, we retire. And after all, how much golf can you play? So uh, we had the opportunity to give this some thought and, and publish our thoughts on this in, uh, in JNS, in this type of uh, neurosurgical forum, in which we examined encore careers, that term made famous by people like Bill Gates, who right here in Seattle stepped down from Microsoft to focus on his philanthropic efforts. He did that at age 53. No one thought he was out to pasture. No one still thinks that. Um, he's contributed mightily and with huge, one might even say greater impact now that he stepped away from his first career and moved on to his encore career. And the challenge for us in neurosurgery is how can we do something similar? Well, let's turn away from neurosurgery, from medicine in, in uh, general, and talk about what lessons we can learn from other disciplines. And the first one I'd like to point out are lessons from the military. 
what they have learned is that diversity needs high-level political commitments. Doesn't need quotas, but it needs high-level commitments. It needs lessons right from the top. If you look at Franklin Delano Roosevelt and this quotation from him in 1943, it could have been spoken yesterday. He says, today we're faced with the preeminent fact that if civilization is to survive, we must cultivate the science of human relationships, the ability of people of all kinds to live together and work together in the same world and at peace. And those challenges still face us today. High level political commitment is necessary. Now, what happened is FDR was not able to live long enough to see that vision through to its completion, but his successor did. President Truman in 1948 issued the famous executive order 9981, which integrated the U.S. military. It's been highly successful. If you look at uh, the metrics of those who are participating in our armed forces compared with the percentage of various minority groups in the population, you'll see that these respected and well-paid jobs in the military are disproportionately attracting minority applicants. That's the good news. The not so good news is that those minorities who are making up large numbers of our armed forces are not rising to the flag ranks, to the leadership ranks, though in the numbers that they should. The good news about that is that there's a procedure for oversight so that that can change. So long-term policy committed to this uh, has led to every branch of our U.S. Armed Forces having a diversity roadmap that not only continues to attract diverse members into the military, but then promotes them through the ranks so that at every level, we the goal is to have a makeup of the military at every level through the ranks that mirrors their, their uh, percentage in the population. And there's oversight to that process. It's called Congress. The Congressional Research Service keeps track of that and publicizes it. So the military has taught us a thing or two, as has business. Now we see that the diversity paradigm has gone from is the right thing to do because it's fairness, it's anti-discriminatory to do it. Now we're moving into it's the profitable thing to do. So business isn't business in business in order to make people feel good. It's in business to drive competitiveness and to turn a profit. So there are a large number of examples that the major consulting companies have put together on this. I show you just one from Boston Consulting Group, but if you look at Bain, McKinsey, Booz Allen Hamilton, they all have the same studies that show the same thing, and that is basically this. That companies with below average diversity scores among their employees make less money than those that have above average diversity scores uh, by about 45 percent. So there's money to be made by investing in diverse teams that drive innovation and drive excellence. Some experts think that it's so important that we should reward CEOs for it. Why not give top executives a financial incentive to hire and promote more people in minority groups or provide a public scorecard like used to be done during the apartheid era of South Africa. So you could divest your portfolio of businesses that weren't actively engaged in diversity. Maybe not even because you think it's more fair, but because they're less likely to be profitable. And then we have the recent uh, lessons from politics during the pandemic and the uh, remarkable success in responding to the pandemic of countries that had female chief executives or presidents. 
And so finally, let's move on even further afield to uh, er the areas of economics and ecology and see what we can learn from those disciplines. So it almost seems self-evident right now that diversification is a good thing for your portfolio, but it wasn't always that intuitive. And in fact, proving that point earned Harry Markowitz the 1990 Nobel Prize in Economics because he was able to prove the, the economic theory of diversification, which is that the more types of investment a person has, the greater they are, a greater likelihood that they will have a net gain with lower risk. It, it seems intuitive. We all follow that in our personal finances uh, today. But at one point, that actually deserves study and garnered awards. Now, if you look at major economists who are proponents of and have done research on diversification, you look at the top row, it's not a very diverse group, I know. But if you look at the bottom row, it is. And those two are uh, experts in economics who are uh, known for their work in diversity, not because of the need for fairness, but because of the need to drive profits. And then finally, what about ecology and biodiversity? And we can ask ourselves, is it merely chance that there are estimated to be over 5 million species of life on planet Earth? Or could it possibly be that, just like in economic theory, that there's some kind of Darwinian advantage conferred to nature herself by the presence of such diversity? And there's too numerous to count uh, peer-reviewed jour uh, journal articles that show this. We know that biodiversity improves the average performance of a system. It enhances both the productivity and the stability of a system. Like in economics, it improves resilience to negative change and lowers the risk of negative outcomes when any system is threatened. So if we synthesize all of this evidence, ecology has shown us that diversification improves performance. Economics has shown us the same thing. If we start with our, where we started at the beginning, uh, we all agree we need the best possible people in neurosurgery. I hope that this review of diversity within our own and other disciplines has convinced you that excellence, innovation, and the strength of our field are greatest if we diversify. And with that, I'd like to thank my outstanding and outstandingly diverse team, as well as uh, Dr. Uh, Harry Jumper, who's our reviewing author, UCSF, and then just share with you a little bit about the graphics that also speak to this. So the uh, this is Javier Yep, who designed the Unity and Diversity flag. He's a student from Peru who got his master's degree in graphic design at San Jose State in the United States. So he's a diverse student whose thesis was on this diversity flag used with his permission. And then Jeff Hansen, who sadly just passed away this year, but he's a patient with NF2 who had bilateral optic nerve gliomas and was disabled on that basis. He couldn't see well, and his impaired vision led him to paint in the way you see here, with very high um, resolution, high vibrant paint, uh, lots and lots of texture in his painting. And Jeff, uh, who just passed at the age of 27 in December, uh, raised nearly $8 million in his young life as an artist philanthropist and always felt that his disability in vision was an ability in his art. And so we use all of his paintings um, throughout this and our presentations with his permission and the permission of his parents. So with that, I'd like to thank you. I'll leave you with my contact information so we can continue the conversation now or in the future. I'd like to thank 
all of my friends and colleagues at the Seattle Science Foundation for the extraordinary warm welcome, for the great work that they do, and this wonderful opportunity to be with all of you today. Thank you. We have some questions or comments. I was hoping we would. I think they're coming to turn on your microphone for you so everyone can hear. Good, thank you. First of all, I want to thank you for such an amazing uh, presentation. Um, and second, I, w I have a question that I want to ask. Um, how do you, how do you think we can get out of this uh, stereotype that only men, I guess, can be, be neurosurgeons? How do we encourage young women that are pursuing a career in medicine to pursue neurosurgery? Well, that's a very good question, and I would say I wouldn't limit it to just encouraging young women. I would encourage everyone who has the interest to come into neurosurgery. We know that we are going to be the strongest and best profession mm -hmm. if we have the best people going into it, right? And I often say I, I, I don't have any talents except as a talent scout. And so um, finding those brilliant people who enjoy neuroscience and want to go into neurosurgery, that's, that's what I want to do. And, you know, increasingly we recognize that you don't have to look like Harvey Cushing to be a good neurosurgeon. You don't have to uh, have his skin tone or his way of speaking. You don't even have to be able to stand, right? You can be in a wheelchair. You don't need to be able to speak fluently to do fluent and gorgeous, technically demanding operations. So I think what we want to do is to create an environment in which all people can feel that if this is what they're interested in, that there will be no impediments based on whatever minority they might represent. Now, having said that, it doesn't just move, you know, the, the, the world isn't like that. You know, the, you know, the famous expression of Martin Luther King that the arc of history is long, but it bends toward justice. Well, we're trying to bend the arc a little bit because uh, from as you, as you saw in this presentation, in uh, 1989, just under 4% of women, uh, neuros uh, of neurosurgeons were women, and by last year it was just 6%. So we're trying to bend the arc a little bit, and so how can we do that? I think maybe that's part of what your question is about, and it's creating a welcoming environment, um, rewarding people for work, rather than, um, than other things, for being able to have mentoring programs help, uh, having outreach to colleges, universities. Having people who look like you is important, but it's not the only thing. All of my mentors were men. I mean, you know, at a certain point, there isn't anyone who looks like the, you, and you don't for, have to forge your way alone. You know, I feel like I can mentor men. I can mentor people who are differently abled than I am, who are from uh, other religions, other continents. So it's more an attitude of sharing knowledge for the good of the profession and the good of the patient. Putting some metrics on monitoring progress not quotas, but putting some metrics on it, I think is important. You know, they say in business that, you know, you, you, um, you need to be able to measure things, right? You can't change what you're not measuring. So we should measure it. There should be some public reporting of it. And once there's public reporting of what we're doing in terms of, uh, changing the, the composition of our group, I, th I think it'll move in the right direction, my own opinion is, without necessitating quotas. But other, other nations and other specialties have taken a different approach to that. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Dr. Rousseau, I have a question. 
Thank you very much. It was a fantastic. Sure. Question. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question, a more, a more technical question. Is there anybody actively regulating like maternity leaves and lactation for 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 women in, during a residency, for example? So the question is about maternity leave. Yeah, maternity uh, yeah. leave and so, lactation right. time. Right. Well, there is a couple aspects to that. And, you know, that certainly affects neurosurgery because it's a very long residency during yeah. childbearing years, right? It's, you know, there's a biological clock that none of us can escape. But what we are seeing is that with the next generation of neurosurgeons that our young male residents want to have time off with newborns and to start their family just as much as the women do. So that mm -hmm. we're increasingly moving toward family leave policies that grant both paternity and maternity leave. And I think this is a quite a bit healthier approach to it. So um, some of these things did require a change in laws, a change in regulations, um, but some of them are just good common decency. Okay, thank you. You bet. Another question over here? Yes. A, yeah, quick question. Uh, first of all, thank you for speaking with us. Um, I was curious with regards to the uh, gender disparity. Um, how does that pale in comparison in terms of neurosurgery versus other surgical fields? So we've looked at that as well, and there are very good data on that. Uh, neurosurgery has lagged behind some other specialties. Now, for example, about 30% of general surgeons are women, and you've seen it's quite a bit lower um, here in the United States. But it's so interesting that it varies so much from place to place and from country to country. For example, uh, Last month, I just came back from spending a week in Sudan. Now, you might think, on the surface, here's a country that's been disconnected from the world for 30 years because of a brutal authoritarian dictatorship. They've just gone through a two-year civil war. It's a majority Muslim population. You would think there's not going to be very many women neurosurgeons there, right? Do you know that 46% of their neurosurgeons are women? And they have similar numbers in Algeria. So it's quite interesting to examine how some of these things you would think are intuitive really aren't. And it has to do very often with single charismatic leaders, either within the discipline or within the country and its educational system. But you're absolutely right that we now have, in the United States, more than 50 percent of our med school classes are women, right? And they are even overrepresented in the top halves of those med school classes. We want smart people to go into neurosurgery. So I think we're if we really want the best and the brightest in our field, and we do, then we're going to be seeing more women. It's, it goes beyond that fairness and discrimination paradigm to what's best for the profession and the patient. Thank you. Pat. Um, I, just wanted, I just wanted to ask what you just mentioned, that more than half of the med students in the U.S. are females right now, because since I'm coming from Germany, I am not uh, so familiar with uh, the United States system of med schools. Um, we have the same phenomenon there, but uh, in the end, and we have it, I think, already since the last decade, that basically half of the med students, or even more than half, are female. Um, but um, little, only little of them end up in surgery let's say. So there is something happening after finishing med school, before choosing your specialization, um, that there is a switch in most of the hats, even though many of them are interested in surgery, that they don't go into surgery. And I think uh, that's a really multifactorial uh, matter why women don't tend to go into surgery. Um, that has to be assessed somewhere. So, well, I think you're right, and uh, and I think it is being assessed. And uh, when you measure it and publicize it, you see that there are perhaps some impediments that are unnecessary. Um, the dean of our medical school is a surgeon and a woman now, first time for both, and uh, so I predict that we're going to see many more of our own medical students 
going into surgery because we have someone who is, you know, at the top of the leadership who is both a woman and a surgeon. So I, I think that sometimes having those, you know, key people in very visible positions makes it easier for everyone going forward. Um, did you, by the way, find out uh, why this was so significant that in Algeria and this other country you mentioned, they had like more than 50 percent of women being neurosurgeons? Or... Um, you know, there's the, the quick answer, the short answer is that we don't know for sure, but it does appear that in regions, whether they're localities, nations, regions, that have had uh, a tumultuous experience uh, that have called men away, the Algerian war against France, that colonial war, the, um, the many years of uh, difficulties that they've had in Sudan, those kinds of things may be playing a part. You know, we have an internal example within our own history in the United States in which during World War II, when so many men were drafted in order to fight that war, women in huge numbers by the millions moved into manufacturing jobs and into the workplace. And that did not continue because the war ended, men came back, the women went back home. And, and so that experiment in women in the workforce then took another generation to to be tested again. But um, so, so the history of what's going on in a country uh, can play a part in this as well.